Good morning. Um, I, uh, I had a blast uh, doing some of my submissions on physics. And one of those was when I had Nikola Tesla come in and I interviewed him. And we talked about a number of things, but the big thing that we talked about was the discussion of the ether of space. And it has been discussed over the years, actually, as many, many things. Everybody's trying to put a name on it, and everyone is trying to describe its functionality. And, of course, both of those things are a very difficult thing to do. Um, and I got a question on it, and they asked me, well, what about the uh, boson field? The, the Higgs field, rather. Excuse me, the Higgs boson particle in the Higgs field. Um, and I think that's describing exactly the same thing. The, the slight differences in uh, Higgs and I believe five other men uh, proposed in around 1960, the Higgs particle. A Higgs particle is a near impossible particle to conceive and to find. So far, uh, people at the front edge of physics are looking at the uh, most finite particles, things like quarks and electrons and the Higgs particle and up quarks, down quarks, sideways quarks, all kinds of different weird things. And I believe there are 11 or 12 right now that we feel we've identified by we, I mean humanity. Again, I have nothing to do with this other than a very appreciative observer. Um, we're trying to put those into a table something like the periodic table and see if these uh, more uh, finite, these smaller particles don't have an association like the great one that we found with what we once believed were the smartest, smallest particles, the atoms. And uh, that was certainly a brilliant thing that, that did a lot for mankind when, um, I forget the guy's name, forgive me, the guy that put the periodic table together found the associations and uh, the similarities uh, depending on number of orbits filled, number of electrons orbiting uh, these various atoms that go the whole way from the uh, hydrogen atom out to the uh, whatever the last one is that uh, we uh, found, which is continually building these things generally in nuclear reactors with these extreme masses, but these fast, fast decays. The Higgs particle, in fact, talking about fast decay, and forgive me if I'm wrong on this because I'm going from memory, but decays at 10 to the negative 22 seconds. That is point twenty two zeros one. That is a ridiculously short amount of time. And that really says a lot. Now, the Higgs field concept says that these fields exist in space in a vacuum and that it is the excitation of these fields that transfer the various uh, transmission of, of waves through space. Um, it's very similar to what I discussed the last time, but I feel that it's a more organized particulate kind of thing. And I think that finding things like the Higgs boson and, and these other particles in the matrix of space is the evolution that we're going through to find this uh, neatly structured particulate matrix that I believe transmits waves through space. And I think that my beliefs are closer to Nikola Tesla's beliefs that uh, Tesla, and I, I can't speak for the man because he's probably, probably the most brilliant man that ever lived certainly one of them, but he had an, an ability to conceptualize and to visualize things that, that are magnificently complex, uh, such as a, a Delta Y uh, AC generator. Uh, he says that he, that he sat and he thought about it and he visualized and ran the thing in his head. Well, even if he's exaggerating a bit, that is a monstrosity of a difficult mechanism. <laughs> it, it really is. Um, three coils, 120 degrees off each, three separate phases of alternating current. And, uh, you know, the, the 
predecessor to the modern day generators is what uh, Tesla invented that uh, uh, was used at Niagara Falls and uh, at the Chicago Convention, I believe, to, to light that up. Anyway, the guy understood the entirety from, from the physics of the transmission of, of light, certainly through space, not so much gravity. And I've discussed my beliefs. My beliefs is that this particulate matrix um, harbors within its structure. If you can imagine a stacking of a, a group of spheres, that those spheres have space where the where they don't quite touch. You know, they're touching. Um, that would be we don't know, but let's imagine that it's an electron orbit, then then it would be a negative charge, and those negative charge would repel one another, and these things would be stacked like, like a box full of uh, pool balls, for instance, or tennis balls. Except that they, they, of course, wouldn't touch the outer orbit, so though they do sometimes exchange electrons along them. And then the question is, how do the photons move through this matrix? My belief is that the photons and other particles settle into the areas of nil or equal charges throughout this this array they they find a static situation and they occupy that space the higgs particle decaying at 10 to the minus 22nd obviously is a particle that readily changes between raw energy and particulate form. And in fact, some talk about particles with zero mass. I think when you're talking about a particle with zero mass, you are indeed talking about energy. Einstein said, if we have two watches and they're both identical and one of those watches is wound up and the other one is not, that the one that's wound up will weigh more than the one that's not. That's an immeasurable difference, but it is real. And the difference between the two is that the wound watch also contains potential energy. The potential energy is acted on um, by gravity. It is mass. And I think in, in my feeling, things that are acted on by gravity contain mass. So both matter as we know it and energy both appear to contain mass. So both of those potentially could be acted on by the gravitational force. And as we discussed, the gravitational force, in my belief, is the rushing of these particles into those things which hold large masses. And I have some, some concepts, maybe we'll get into that at a later date, about why that might occur and what might be taking place there that causes the um, these particles to leave the matrix and to flow into these large masses. Now, if you're talking about the Earth and the Moon, and I'll take two things, and this is my little sniffy thing for when I have a cold, and this is a piece of pipe. So let's let's pretend like like the sniffy thing is the Moon. And the piece of pipe here is the earth. Well, actually, the sniffy thing in the pipe are doing it right now. But imagine that between these two, there's this matrix. Matrix. And that a huge amount of stuff is flowing into the pipe. And a huge amount of stuff is flowing into the little sniffy thing here. Between the two, imagine the matrix. If these things are filling the matrix and these particles are flowing to fill need within these, and I say need, like I say, I'll get into my own personal philosophy of what that may be, then that would create a void of these particles within that association between the two elements of mass. So in this area between the two, there'd be very very uh, uh, a lesser field of these particles. It would not be at equilibrium. It would constantly be 
moving toward equilibrium, that would draw these two masses together as if they're being pulled together by the losses between them. Imagine that. That makes sense to me. So that's, that's my feeling about it. And indeed, it is the Higgs field that I'm talking about. Um, I, I differ in my philosophy, and I do not know these things. These are things that I feel, and they are not hard proven knowledge, as are the things that, that Mr. Higgs and the other five physicists that worked on this problem as is their Higgs field. Um, as time goes by, mankind will learn more and more about these things, and hopefully one day we'll understand the whole. So that's my answer to how the Higgs field relates to my conversation about the ether of space with my dear friend um, and, and my um, near hero, Nikola Tesla. Thank you very much, guys. Talk to you later on.